real estate is such a small portion of the job because people think that you need to know everything about real estate. Real estate's nothing if you don't know how to develop relationships and if you're not organized and if you don't follow up, right? Like all the things leading up to it. So I could make a perfect realtor without that little piece, which is crazy. Because if you say that to a realtor, they're like, that's, what do you mean? That's the hugest piece. And it's <laughs> not, right? Like we know that we can get realtors to join our team today and fail quickly if you don't set them up with all these basic things. And uh, so it... Welcome to the Chip Black Live podcast, where I sit down with proven, tested leaders that are getting it done right now to take you behind the curtain of what's working so that you can take it away from this video that you may watch, the podcast you may listen to, and put it in action for you. And today, I have Kobe Sway, and it's funny, he, I think he plays COO, he plays CEO, he plays janitor. Bottom line, he runs the number one team in Nebraska, the Bradley team. Kobe Sway, thanks for being with you, bud. Absolutely. Glad to be here, John. Thank you. So let's do this really, really quickly. Um, give everyone uh, just kind of the scope of, of the business. How many agents you guys have, transactions, staff, transactions closed last year, how you're pacing this year, and then we'll dig in. Yeah, so we have 50 real estate agents, 12 staff, some here, some overseas. Uh, we do 960 transactions last year. We're on pace to do a little over 1,000 this year. And um, yeah, we're just rocking and rolling, you know, just trying to survive through the market. And uh, it's been a whirlwind, that's for sure. <laughs> right. So let's let's go just real quickly from a background, because it's one thing that fascinates me. And, and I've seen it before um once in a while but i think that others need to hear this um how long have you been in this role and had you ever been directly in the real estate business as a salesperson as a manager or anything before you took this role on yeah it's uh it's it's funny because i come from corporate america right so i I used to manage cell phone stores, right? Like I literally would open cell phone stores and I'd manage people. So hiring, training, accountability systems, like all the things that <clears throat> I think makes a good leader, right? Like at t did a great job of teaching me how to be a leader. And uh, Adam Briley, the team leader, reached out to me about three and a half years ago and said, hey, do you want to come manage my team? I go, I know nothing about real estate. He goes, perfect. You'll fit right in because nobody else knows what the heck they're doing, right? Um but my my background really resonated, I think, with how you should run and operate a team, right? And some people wear the team leader hat because they used to sell. And I make the argument all the time, I think I'm a good leader because I never sold real estate, because I come from accountability and systems and standards and rules and training and support and and uh, real estate I know nothing about, but people are people. It doesn't matter if we sell cars, houses, TVs, we started mortgage and insurance last year. So it it doesn't matter at the end of the day, people are all the same. And uh, yeah, so about three and a half years ago is when I started on the journey. So we were a pretty small team back then and uh, not to knock what Adam built because he built a phenomenal business and he ran a Navy SEAL team, which is a really popular way to run your business. 10 agents, $100 million doing about 350 homes. Great business. And uh, I just happened to, you know, do the amazing things that he does, right? And just add a little bit of corporate element, if you will. Really good. Talk about your first year in the role um, because you've got a couple things. Well, really three things. It is doing the job. There's probably going to be four or three. Doing the job, learning the job, and then building the relationships. Three things. Building the relationships with the people. Talk about how you, because um, one of the things that I'd share with everyone um, is Kobe is a really, really good teacher. I've, I've had the opportunity to, to see him speak and train in our rooms. And the most important thing, um, because it's who Kobe is, and it's what we want to do is um, have you learn from this, this time. Talk about that first year looking at, I've got to learn the business. Um, I've got to do the job and I've got to build the relationships with the people um talk about the uh any bumpy rides on that journey <laughs> yeah i mean it's a lot of people it's not easy to say all the the things that you didn't do well right like but it 
for sure. There was a lot of struggles, right? Like agents immediately, they looked at me, they're like, why is this guy telling me how to do real estate when he doesn't know anything about real estate? Right. So I did all the wrong things at first, <laughs> right? Like it, luckily I probably didn't do as bad as probably I think, right? Like you're always tougher on yourself. But I think the first thing was right. Sitting down with the agents and asking them, why don't you use the CRM? It, you know, what's cool about the CRM is it can actually help you keep track of things like a cell phone. Right. <laughs> so like, a joke I always say, John, is I'm like, hey, you know what my phone number is? No, I don't. Oh, do you use your cell phone to keep track of that? Like a calendar, right? Um, so I, I was pretty tough on agents with the CRM. And this was, a, the, I mean, one of the best performing teams, if not number one, number two. I mean, we were right there in the mix. And uh, I looked at them and I said, guys, you're not that good. If I look at your conversion rate, and no one talked about conversion rate when I got here. It was just, hey, we're selling a lot of houses. Well, yeah, you got a lot of leads, right? So their conversion rate was, I mean, you know, three and a half, four percent, something like that. Um, and to me, I went in there with the wrong message. And I was like, hey, guys, you got to look at conversion rate. You got to look at numbers. And I got a lot of slack for it. A lot of people were like, are you trying to run a corporation here? Is this micromanagement? Is this I left real estate or excuse me, corporate America to get into financial mm -hmm. freedom. I don't want to be told what to do. But, you know, who is this guy coming in? So um for sure, we had some of that, right? And uh, and then, um, so the conversations were had. I went in there and I knocked them down some pegs, if you will, right? Like, I guess with the lack of better terminology, but knocked them down from their swagger and said, hey, your conversion's not where it needs to be. And then I shifted focus and I went back to what I know is, is to be true. And this is what I talk about all the time with people is you've got to develop a relationship with somebody. And the only way to do that is through trust, right? Like, and I know, John, you talk about the trust bank, but it, I went into the conversations like this. I said, hey, you know what? I don't have a job unless you sell houses. And I'm not going to keep my job unless you sell more houses. So if I, if I went in there and said, hey, do all these things, right? They're going to be like, no. But if I said, I'm going to be side by side with you and I'm going to make you more money right? Than you made before, have more time back in your day, which I've learned now, right? People only care about time or money. Back then, I, I thought everybody wanted it all. But right. it, it was interesting. So I was like, hey, let's go in there and get you more money, more time back with your family and be more efficient. And I sold it to them. Not the fact that I didn't believe it, but the fact that they finally started to trust me. Hey, this guy is maybe a little crazy chicken, but he's starting to make sense. If I actually met and followed up and nurtured more people better, I wouldn't have to wait for 150 new calls if I just focused on five or 10. And uh, so that was, that was, I just went back to what I knew best, which is you got to go in there side by side with people. And then I think knowing the business was a struggle, right? Like it, and uh, that's still to this day, I don't know everything about contracts and I purposely don't want to know about real estate because I also, I want to have a different perspective. And when you get too far in the weeds, you can't see stuff. And the easiest way to say it, John, is like going into a restaurant and you see dust. Those workers walk past it every day, but they don't see it. But you see it, right? Or a dirty bathroom. They don't see it because they're used to it. Um, so it's kind of purposeful that I'm still not an expert in real estate. And so how have you guys overcome that? I'm, I'm sure Adam supports in that space. But let me let me ask you this. And, and, and I think it's really, really neat because so many leaders that know too much, they end up being rescuers and helpers, not leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys developed an environment where, listen, you don't want, you know, the patients running the asylum, but is there a lot of volunteerism in your culture where actual, maybe the more experienced agents will help out the less experienced in, in some situations? Yeah. So what we did was uh, we started to develop mentors, right? So we took, I don't know, five agents, six agents on the team and we went to them and we said, hey, we want to build a massive team. And no one was doing this in our area, right? Like to me, I, I think of 150 realtors. That's my goal, right? I want to sell 4,000 houses a year. I want to do a billion dollars in real estate. I don't know nothing about real estate, right? right. And uh, so- I'm like, guys, I have these huge goals, but I don't know anything about real estate. I just don't. And uh, so we started off with mentors. We really did. Just if I go back three years ago, we had just four or five mentors. When a new agent joined, they would have me as their coaching accountability partner. And then they would have their mentor to answer anything related to real estate. And uh, so they would help with, you know, contracts and um, when they got into a jam or, you know, something basic. But when it came to sales, overcoming objections, mental health work-life balance, 
time management, the CRM, I could do nearly everything. Real estate is such a small portion of the job because people think that you need to know everything about real estate. Real estate's nothing if you don't know how to develop relationships and if you're not organized and if you don't follow up, right? Like all the things leading up to it. So I could make a perfect realtor without that little piece, which is crazy because if you say that to a realtor, they're like, that's, what do you mean? That's the hugest piece. And it's <laughs> not, right? Like we know that we can get realtors to join our team today and fail quickly if you don't set them up with all these basic things. And uh, so it, it really bode well. And uh, luckily 18 or uh, Adam did a really good job of fostering that environment. He goes, hey, you know what, guys? Kobe doesn't know everything about real estate. Don't go to him about real estate. We would even joke at meetings. Like, don't ask him about real estate because he's going to give you the wrong information. Talk to your mentor. Um, and it, it, it was crazy because Adam got more time back in his day by setting up the mentors. And we hired, we went from 10 agents to 20 or 25, something like that. And Adam's like, I have more time back in my day than I ever did before with more realtors and I'm not pulling my hair up. So- so looking at, and, you know, we've had this conversation many times before you've heard me say it two bajillion times, the tiny hinges that swing big doors. One of the real tiny hinges that really has allowed you guys to scale is the mentor mentor program. Yeah, that was a huge part of our scaling. Yeah. I mean, it's, we don't do the mentoring today. I have a full-time coach and uh, that's new, right? So now I have yeah. a coach on the team that meets with agents and does that, the, the mentoring program ran its course. It's a great way to do it. And uh, you got to have people that believe in it though. So I think another mistake we ran into is I assumed everyone wanted us to grow. I assumed everybody wanted us to share, right? Like you're laughing, John, because it's funny, but people don't want that. They don't want more agents taking their leads because they think they need, you know, 200 leads. And that was one of the first things we did was guys, I'm going to take your leads down from 50 to 25. Now, if you want to hear some crazy stuff at a meeting, tell them you're going to take their lead count in half. Um, but that, you know, that was another story, but, but anyway, um, did that, did that increase conversion when you limited the leads down? So, so John, when we changed the, when we went from 50 to 25, we doubled our conversion, doubled it. <laughs> and, um, since then we take our lead count down and we do a lot of other stuff now, but it, we took it down from 25 to 20 to 15 to 10. And you know what? When you give them 25, they sell two. You give them 20, they sell two. You sell, you give them 15, they sell. It, it's almost like the numbers two. Again, if it's quality, it depends on the lead. But if you give them a quality lead, right, they'll still continue to sell about two of every 10, right? Um, it, it's just amazing. And you'd think the agents were like going to kill us. But but back to what I was saying is, the mentors, I assumed everybody wanted to grow. Everybody wanted to, because you think more signs and more yards, it'd be good, but they don't think like that. If they thought like that, they would be on their own team. If they thought like that, they'd start their own companies. And it's tough for team leaders to think that, honestly. We have to remind ourselves, but they, they didn't think like that. So sadly, I had a couple of mentors that were like, you know, hey, I'm not on board for this. I don't like this. And they weren't doing the right things with new agents. And so we we asked them to leave or they stopped being mentors. And uh, we changed we changed their perspective. And a lot of those agents are actually still with us today. So it's not like we had a mass exodus or something like that. But it was it was interesting because they said one thing. But then when you add it, when you asked a new agent something, the new agent was like, oh, well, they were saying all these negative things. So it was interesting. Uh, um, I, I want I want to hit this question, because at, at this point in time, anyone watching and, and or listening um, is hearing. Wow, I'm hearing a lot of standards, truth telling, and yeah. you know, the, uh, listen, we, we sit in rooms and everyone's, we're all trying to figure out how can I hold that standard? And because the how, the how to is, is less of the, the, the tactic of it, but it's more of the, am I going to lose people? Um, I, I want people to hear this though too. You guys have had remarkable retention as a whole. Yeah in the time frame that you've been there. I mean, number one, Kobe, when someone new comes in and number two, someone who comes from corporate America, who, who brings the structure you bring, it's pretty normal. Um, yeah. Cause Adam's, I mean, Adam is intense. He's a results guy, but Adam can oh, be yeah. loosey goosey, right? Hey, he's so loosey -goosey. dude, right. He's loosey goosey, but he's also <laughs> a little irrational, right? Like he's, right. he's a little aggressive, like most good uh visionaries right visionaries are just they're just they're different thinkers right um mm -hmm. sure. how how have you uh because i think this is this is where the magic is in someone's role like yours is um and 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 it's 
I've watched it be the the breaking of people in your role where it just didn't work out and and they knew they weren't working out. How have you been able to keep the retention? I mean, because slowly but surely over time, you've consistently held to standard and then ratcheting up a little bit more. Yeah. Talk to everyone about the retention issue. How are you doing that, man? Well, it's it's hard, but it's I think the thing is too, transparency is huge. So we used to do this exercise all the time. It's really interesting. Um, it and I'm gonna share, I'll share it with you right now. So one thing that I learned is <clears throat> You can do this exercise with a real estate agent. You can do this in anybody, but you can do this exercise with a real estate agent, which is called my favorite boss and my least favorite boss. And you can ask them about their least favorite boss and they can name them. They can tell you what they wore. They can tell you all the negative things they didn't like about that person, right? And then when it comes to their favorite boss, it's very similar. They can tell you all the reasons they changed their life or they helped them or 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 they helped them get into whatever it. It, and I can do that myself, right? Like I can think of my favorite boss and what he did to me. So it it started off with an exercise, sitting down and having a one-on-one -on -one and just asking the agents, what is it that you want from me? What is it your what are your expectations from me? Okay. And then I, I so I just asked some basic questions, you know, tell me what what you are looking for. And then something simple to do, a start, stop, continue. What do you want us to start doing? Stop doing, continue doing. And then I rolled into the favorite boss, Lee's favorite boss. And it was a longer one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know, maybe it was 50 minutes or something like that, but it was well needed, right? Um, and I just said, hey, this is this is great. So I just want to make sure that if I if I am transparent with you right now and I tell you, John, I'm gonna do all these things over here because I want you to I want you to come to me when I'm not doing those things. So I want you to tell me if I'm being late or I just you know, I say something negative at a meeting you don't like, or I call you out. Uh, uh, is that okay with you, John? Now that I know some of the things you don't like, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that I never do those things. But I have your permission that if I am out of line, you'll call me out on that. And agents will come up to me and say, hey, Kobe, like, I'm not happy with these things. And they're comfortable with me sharing that instead of sharing it to a new team leader or a new brokerage. So that's, that's one small piece. And then the next thing that I would tell you is um, Adam is constantly focusing on making sure that we have the right fit. So we do... We have a team workout every Friday we have our agents go to. We have team builders at Adam and Stacy's personal house. We do that quarterly. We have uh, a team meeting every single week that we have agents go up there. We have Adam, and I'm not saying this is planned, but Adam is super vulnerable. He'll cry in front of people because he's so grateful that he's seen an agent change their life. And we make it clear, you guys, we selfishly, you're going to be with us for a period of time and it may not be forever, but while you're here, we want to impact your life. We don't want you to just make money because you can get better splits everywhere. Like who cares, right? Like, but we really, we hit it on the head and that's transparency is huge. Just tell them, Hey, I know you're not going to stay with me forever, but if I'm going to do the things you're asking me not to do, you know, I'm going to be that favorite boss and I'm going to be up front with you and I'm going to help you. And I'm going to develop you. Um, I, I think there's something to be said there. Adam does a really good job. I mean, everybody does team builders and culture. I get all that. But Adam does a really good job of telling you, John, Kobe, Adam, doesn't matter. He says, he sits them down or he tells them at a meeting, I'm here to grow your net worth. I'm here to make you successful in life. It's not just about selling houses. If we focused on helping people buy and sell houses, we would have lots of people leaving us. And our retention is like, if you look at the amount of agents that we've had that are successfully selling, our retention is probably less than 10%. It might even be 5%. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we have agents come in that don't fit. They don't hit our standards. We've got standards. If they don't meet those, we ask them to leave. Like we're not, We don't have a 5 or 10% all in. It's probably about 50% that join. I exit the business, right? I tell them, you're not a good fit for us. But people that are productive, it's probably under 10. How... Um... In, in, in the market shifting and you're doing something remarkable, I think anyone that's even, uh, my opinion, based on the many conversations and rooms I've been in over the last year, I think anyone that's even even with last year is remarkable. Um, what has been the biggest challenge for sure? There's a challenge that you've got interest rates show up and transaction counts are impacted, but then it's going back to the human beings. What, what has been the biggest challenge challenge in driving the production through this change in the marketplace and, and what have you guys done? Yeah, it's, 
Well, what's interesting is every team leader broker across the country is saying it, you guys got to go back to the basics. And I hear it time and time and time again. And what's funny is the agents don't know what the basics are because if they did, they'd be doing them. Right. So it's easy for you to say, get back to the basics, right? It's like saying, Hey, get back to what you used to do five years ago. A lot of real estate agents were in the business five years ago. Right. And they don't know what the basics were like. You guys, we get short-term memory loss. It's like, the easiest way to think about it is that we didn't do open houses for three or four years. Why? We didn't ask agents to cold call. We didn't ask them to door knock. We didn't ask them even to really follow up. We just said, hey, answer the phone. If they're good, work them. If not, set them aside. You know, so it when we started off doing that white noise, get back to the basics. And then I realized something. What is the basics? And what we would do is at team meetings, we would just say, you guys, we want you to make calls this week. And here's the script. You, and then we would ask for feedback. How are the calls going? Hey, we want we want everyone to do an open house going forward. Every realtor does an open house every week, right? Now, does every single agent do it? Of course not. But the majority of the agents do an open house every single week. And then they look to their peers and they go, huh, I wonder what that person's doing. And then, you know what we do, John, is we say, hey, have you been doing open houses? We ask them at team meeting. Have you been doing open houses? Oh, you have. Oh, okay. Perfect. So who is in, who in here is doing open houses? Who's not? And then they raise their hand and they're like, hmm, maybe I should start doing open houses, right? Like you talk about all the time that when you, when you bring somebody in, let's say they're new or you bring somebody on board and you change the standards, which we did over the years, right? Like my first new hire, I literally go, here's the CRM. I'm going to watch what you do. Cause I have no idea how to, I don't even know how to onboard. Didn't know anything. Right. And now we have probably like a 50 checklist, right? To bring somebody on, but we ratchet up the expectations. So now we have daily calls, uh, videos sent every day, social media posts. We have all these crazy things and they're not crazy. But if I asked an agent three years ago, they'd be like, well, when I onboarded, Kobe just said, good luck, right? So, <laughs> but when the new people start doing well, it'll ratchet up the other people. And you don't go to your top people and say, all right, John, if you don't do an open house, you're off the team because that's going to kill your standards, your culture, your report, everything you committed to being their favorite boss. Because again, just because you're their favorite boss doesn't mean you hold their hand, you're their best friend. The favorite boss is accountability and helping them get financial freedom, right? Or more time back with their family. It's either money or time, right? So it's, and then the last thing we did was we went deep, 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 deep on the why. Why are you actually in real estate? What would this mean to your family? And we went away from that because the market was so good. You didn't need to talk about the why. Yeah, yeah. Do, um, do you have some you're still trying to pull along that just um, are not accepting the work that needs to be done? Or do you feel that the, the whole group is, okay, yes, I've got to do this different work. What's it looking like for you guys right now? Yeah, it. What's crazy is I joke about this all the time. People say, why would you ever want to manage a team? Or or some people joke, it's like, you know, you talk about the the asylum, right? Or or babysitting, right? Like, asylum, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, so it's, it, to me, here's what I think about. If I had, if every person, and this is, this is what every team leader should be thinking. If you had the absolute perfect realtors on your team, you would not have a team, right? Every team leader has dysfunction has issues, has standards, has uh, training problems, has a problem child, has, you know, somebody with mental health, like we're all struggling at some point in our lives, right? And uh, for me to say everyone's doing it, I wouldn't have a job. So I love that human beings are messy. And <laughs> again, even the best salespeople, my wife's one of the best real estate agents in the city, and she falls off the wagon and she needs someone to hold her accountable or call her out or check on her. Um, she'll call and say, yeah, I got no business going on. And you have to remind her like, okay, well, what did you do two weeks ago? Well, I made a bunch of calls. Do you think you should do that? Yeah, I'm, yeah, what am I talking to you for? I'm gonna go make, right? Like, and she's been doing it 10 years. Adam has been doing it 16 and he is back to calling and texting and he needs Stacy to kick his butt in the rear. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we for sure have people that are not there. We yeah. for sure have people that are coming into meetings or one-on-ones. And they're still not convinced. They're still hoping that the market, you know, flops, right? Or changes back. What are you seeing with uh, recruits, whether it's licensed agents from, 
from other companies or new agents? Yeah. What's what's have you seen less people getting in the business, more getting in, or or a lot more flow? Because you know how it goes that. Well, I don't want to be on a team. They tell you what to do and the splits are this and that. But then they start looking at their business because we're hearing a lot of, well, maybe I'm not so worried about that split. And you want me to do things. What What are you seeing in the recruiting conversations you guys are having right now? So the conversations we're having from other agents are, can you hold me accountable? Right. Because my brokerage doesn't. Can you provide quality leads? Because my brokerage doesn't. What's your support look like? Because I don't even know who I would call for support, right? Like what I've been using lately to explain the team is you can do two things. You can join a gym for $10 a month and they don't care. They got your $10, right? right. They don't don't care. I won't name names. Or you could hire a personal trainer for $150 an hour. Who do you think is going to be in better shape, right? And that's my message lately is if you want to be in the best physical condition, you need a personal trainer, and that's what this team is going to be, your personal trainer. Now, am I going to am I going to be there lifting the weights? No. Am I going to be there, you know, making sure that you drink your protein shake? No, I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up when you want me to show up, and I'm going to be in there calling you out on your stuff. Um, so that's kind of the conversation shift I've had lately. A lot of people have called and said they're not seeing anywhere near what they need from their brokerage. They're starting to identify, oh, I can't just sit around. And I've been playing that hard on the calls. And then new agents... Um, obviously they don't know any better. So when a new agent joins, they're like, oh yeah, okay, I can do this. This is easy. Right. Like, um, I don't know if I would say there's less people jumping in the first call with a new agent is how's the market. And can I sell because they're scared? Um, but, uh, I wouldn't say less. I would just say that they're actually starting to understand that, that there's a different job required two years ago. I would say, Hey, you know what? Do you have a pulse? Then you can sell real estate. right? Right. And it was an easier conversation, but it's uh yeah. So that's the conversations we're having now. You guys, do you have enough time under your belt in this new marketplace with bringing on brand new versus some of the experienced? Um, are what what are you seeing with the brand new? Are, are you seeing that they don't know any different, so they're jumping in more than than others would and have a greater work ethic? Or do you yeah. still have a mix of people that are well, you know, this should be easy. Money grows on the tree as a real estate agent. Yeah, I mean, and it, you know, papers it's made from trees, right? So it's like it's uh. It, so I this year, I really wanted to focus on agents that have been in the business one to three years that were just not as productive as they should have been, could have been, or compared to my team, right? So I hammer dial people that are under three years. And what I've noticed is people that have been somewhere else, and I know, not from an arrogant standpoint, but I know from a confidence standpoint, they weren't trained properly. They don't have support. They don't have accountability. They don't have our leads. They don't have our systems. They don't have anything that we have. And uh so they're, they're not going to take it for granted, right? Like a new agent who joins, they don't know any better. So they look around, they're like, oh man, like this, okay. Maybe I'll join this guy across the seat for better splits. I don't know. They Not that they do, but they start to guess it. Someone who's been somewhere else doesn't guess, but um, it newer agents are jumping on. So they are great because they'll do anything you ask them to do. The problem with, with not setting expectations at the meeting or when you interview them is, hey, John, just so you know, it's going to be very difficult to stay on this team. You're going to have to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. If you don't do those things, that's fine. Now, you don't have to be here. We're not the team for you. If you don't want these six things, and just so you know, we focus on accountability, system standards, but numbers don't lie. So I set expectations very clear up front. So most of the time, agents don't join us because they feel like we're going to you know, micromanage them and tell them what to do. Um, but the ones that are joining are great for that because of the expectations. And then on the flip side, those one to three years, the COVID agents, if you would, that people call them, those are yeah. great. Those are great because they don't, they, they finally realize, you know what? I better get my butt in gear. I've had enough pain. Yeah. Yep, um, exactly. you guys talk about the ISA piece. Um, you guys run with ISAs right now, not running with yes. ISAs. Okay. Yes. We have ISAs now. It's, mm-hmm. it's always a challenge. I mean, I talk to people all the time and I'm like, it, we were just at Zillow Unlock and they were, they, you know, people were presenting on the perfect ISAs. And I think one of the biggest challenges for an ISA is staying motivated and getting hung up on in the grind. And I constantly struggle with why wouldn't that person just go be a realtor? And I know plenty of people that can grind all day and never meet clients. I get that. We've gone back and forth on honestly, um, we have three today, you know, so we definitely have them. 
but the majority of the leads I send directly to the realtors. We have higher conversions. We have a better success rate. Sometimes ISAs show favoritism. Sometimes that causes problems. And sometimes ISAs don't want to be on call 24 um, seven. So we've gone back and forth. I, you know, stuff to say, John, honestly, I, there isn't like, I could tell you like, they're amazing. They're, they're not good. They're bad. I mean, we've had a lot of experiences the three years that I've been here today. We're going away from the ISA model and we're trying to get more leads into more realtors hands. And I'm trying to get new agents to make more calls and follow up more. And that's the plan today. Who knows in three months, I'll be like, give me the ISA is back. Right. Good for you. Well, and I think it, when, when, um, when team leaders are really, really honest, they, they'll they tell you the agent's the best person to answer the call, but the challenge is the agent won't answer the call and do the follow-up. So, but yeah, we've got people that are doing it really, really well. And then people yep. that, that aren't doing it and they're happy too. I think it is a, a constant journey of discovery. Let's wrap on this. Let's talk about um, ancillary services you're doing. Uh, did you roll out insurance and mortgage this year or was it last year? Talk about those two and 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 the great lessons in doing that. <laughs> so we rolled out, we had insurance and mortgage last year and then title this year. Okay. Um, and let me tell you, I would never recommend you start two businesses the same month. <laughs> and I would never tell you that... Uh, insurance or mortgage just because it sounds like oh it's an easy add-on that you know like there's a lead and the team's just going to run to the house and be like hey here's here, here's an insurance lead and a mortgage lead and it's great and it's i think a lot of people struggle with it. it again i go back to uh so many companies that do bundled services right like mm -hmm. I, I mean who doesn't do a, you look at like a cable company internet company a cell phone company right like uh, or, or so many other businesses that try to bundle their services. It's like looking at a car and they have the insurance person there and the extended warranty person there and they have everybody there, right? Um, it's difficult. I will tell you, it, it really, it's, again, people are people and it, it can take you off your path. So I can tell you that, and I've, we've had these conversations, it's literally taken me off my path. I feel like we were doing so well with the Briley team, we were here, and then it was like, wait, I got to jump in and hire an insurance agent. Oh, wait, now I got to train on insurance. And I don't know anything about insurance. And then it's like, <laughs> there's an insurance conference and then there's insurance standards and then there's rules and laws. And can you, can you, you know, is there RESPA violations? And then you look at the mortgage business. So I can tell you that it has been a massive challenge. And even from my standpoint as an integrator, it's taxing on your time. It's just, do you want to recruit? Do you want to train? Do you want to hire? Do you want to go blow up your mortgage business, your insurance business, your real estate business. Like it's so hard to figure out time. And I've actually talked to a few people in your circle about how they manage their time. And it's, it's difficult. I will say it is very, very difficult. I would never tell anybody go do mortgage and insurance in the same year. It's going to be easy. But what I will say is what, what the businesses have are all the same things. You have uh, people that need motivation, right? We think it's motivation. We have people that, you know, um, are looking for leadership. We have people that are trying to convert leads and we have, there's a lot of synergies. So what I will say is it's, it's an easier conversation because they're the same conversations with all the businesses. Um, but trying to figure out all the different businesses, because it's like, Hey, you, you can cross sell with insurance and you can upsell and you can, you can retarget and it's, it's a lot of different moving parts. Um, that's for sure. Really good. Uh, final question. What is, what's the number one thing that you're focused on in 2024? If you're, you're saying this is my number one lever in driving the Riley group in a, um, in, in what I think is a pretty unpredictable season we're in, that's my opinion. Um, yeah. What's your number one obsession in 2024 of all the things you've got going on? Yeah. It's hard to come up with one because it's there's so much, like you said. But I think my number one obsession, which it's been for three years, honestly, is your people. I think at the end of the day, my number one concern is my my person in front of me. And that's my insurance agents, my mortgage loan officers, my managers, my admin, my employees, and then my realtors, right? Um, I, if I can, and that's just how we've gone through this difficult time. If we just would have stood up front, John, and said, guys, get back to the basics. Good luck. Hey, get back to calling people out of the CRM. Good luck, right? Like it, you've got to help people find the path. I think that 
you've got to be that person that guides them in this storm, if you will, that cloud. You got to be that lighthouse, that that bright light that brings them home, the safe harbor, if you will. But so my number one focus is going to be my people and making sure that from from a mental health standpoint, from a development standpoint, from and I don't like to call it a motivation standpoint, but making sure that we're we're diving into why do you do this job? And uh, it's the same with the manager. If you have a good manager, you know, as a manager, why someone is doing the job they're doing, because you need them to do the job when they're not there. And it, it's it's something to be said about. It, it's like carrots and sticks. I can give you a carrot. You can run after and I can dangle it in front of you all day long and I can beat you with a stick. And, and of course, you'll do the job right when I'm there, when I'm there, because I'm either going to beat you or I'm going to give you a carrot. But you need people to do the job when you're not around. And you can't do that unless you know their why, because their why is what's going to get them out of bed when they're sick. The why is going to get them to make the cold call, do the door knock, you know, sell the insurance policy. But if you don't do a good enough job of developing trust, right, they're going to, you can just sit in there and be like, hey, do you want to sell houses? Perfect. What do you want to make? hundred grand? Oh, perfect. Yeah, let's sell a hundred. It, it's not enough today. It's just not. So my obsession is my people and, uh, it's whether that's getting a few more people for sure, we're going to grow, but I think it's just doing a good job of helping your people because they're all stressed out. They're all freaking out. They're all nervous about the rates. They're all nervous about the real estate market, the, the, the lawsuits, this is like, there's always a million things, but you got to be the one that's not panicking with the plan and identify when they're needing to be raised. And they don't raise their hand, John, and say, Hey, I'm drowning. They're embarrassed to tell you. So you've got to go seek them out. Right. And you got to identify your people. Well, what a perfect wrap, because um, for those watching and listening to this is, you know, we started with, here's someone that came from AT&T and, you know, I don't want to know more about real estate. And, and I think there's, and I know Kobe really, really well. And I know underneath it, I know where his heart is though, too, is that it doesn't matter whether you know real estate up, down, sideways, every way, if you don't connect with the people. Kobe knows his number one lever is these people with a genuine, authentic care and concern with their personal life that's attached to this business. And then the business principles are universal. Sure, there's a question on a, you know, a counteroffer or this or that. Hey, that's that's really the easy stuff. It yeah. really is. So awesome. Kobe, I appreciate you, man. It's um, I'm proud of you. Uh, proud to have you as a friend. And get to work with you because uh, there's very, very few that that have done the remarkable work that you've done um, and will continue to do. Excited to see what happens. Thanks, brother. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.